Get the speed of hemostasis of a cautery tonsillectomy with a tissue sparing, decreased pain, and decreased edema of a cold steel tonsillectomy. And here's my tonsillectomy odyssey. I was taught at University of Chicago. These are sort of my old laryngology years. Right? I did two years before that in general surgery. But we used a sickle knife to cut the mucosa. Scissors, like a medicine bomb scissors, to define the plane between the tonsil and the muscle bed. At that point, you take your finger, dissect the tonsil away from the muscle bed. You can't really either get your finger down to the inferior polar. It's just too much of a adherence there. So then you take a snare and snare it up. Of course, it bleeds like crazy at that moment. So you put a big pack in there. Then you grab your suction cauter and you start cauterizing. And to my mind, whoops, to my mind, this is the worst of all possible worlds. You got a lot of bleeding. You have a lot of cautery tissue damage. And so, um, and the worst of all, this actually was the worst of all thing, was that they tended to ooze in the PACU. The last thing I really want to do is have the nurses talking about you and your tonsillectomies compared to those cautery tonsillectomies. So I asked someone, well, how are you taking them out? He said, I use the cautery. This was a truly a C1 do one. I mean, it's, it's really quite simple. Um, the cautery, though, it does have a lot of heat. It doesn't spread that bad, but it's certainly hot. Um, great hemorrhage control, fast tissue preservation, but a lot of edema, pain, delayed healing. KTP laser, I think, was sort of a joke because you would cut, 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 it would bleed, you would use the cautery, you would cut some more, you'd have a laser technician, you'd have to set it up, the anesthesiologist would be worried about the tube getting it on fire, but it had great cachet because you'd say, wow, I'm taking out the tonsil with a laser. And some people would play on that, but I just didn't think it was practical. From 2000, to 2010, I used this coblation, which is the term for cold ablation. You use this radio frequency, and it was much colder. So we're getting close to Nirvana, but really not exactly there. It also had a limited bipolar on the other side, because the, the hemostasis was good, but not that good. And so you would just do that. And this was all irrigated, so you'd have a, a um, saline irrigation to set this off. Good hemostasis, pretty quick. You had to change every team to set up the irrigation and make sure they had the, had the foot pedal right and everything like that. It was a bit of a hassle, but I, I was happy with it overall. Um, but I don't think the pain control was that much better. Maybe a little bit, but not much better than the cautery time selection. So, uh, so from 2010 to the present, I started using this tissue welding technique. I guess it must be my either my striving for improvement or just my poor personal um, stick to itiveness because the, the, this technician, this equipment tech, you should say, try this. I said, no, no, I like what I'm doing. No, no, I like what I'm doing. Fine. He sort of wore me down. I said, okay, I'll try it. And it was very tedious to learn the technique. But the technique is the tissue is heated with a heating element. It's not electrocautery. And the heat dispersion is not much beyond body temperature. I, I mean, in my hand, it's a much longer dissection. That's because I'm preserving a lot of tissue. But there's good hemostasis. I actually use a bipolar cautery for any incompletely cauterized vessels with this technique because the blunt tips of this really don't catch the vessels very well, so I use a bipolar. And it's interesting, too, because you would think a bipolar cautery at 15 watts is, like, super gentle. I remember when I was in my fellowship, I was doing, I actually was bipolaring little vessels on the surface of the cerebellum. I don't do that type of work at all. I really abandon that type of thing. But bipolar cautery, it's a sensitive technique, but when you look at the bipolar cautery in the bed of this tissue welding technique, it looks terrible. It looks like you're burning the tissue. It looks grotesquely burning. So it's an interesting indication of how tissue sparing this is. And, and I think it does have uh, significantly better pain control. I remember my nurses, like just, remember these are all adults practically that I do, and they're just saying, wow, we're not getting the phone calls. We just, we have to call them up to see how, how are you doing. They're just doing fine. So these are my results, much better pain control, fewer phone calls. Even I would tell the staff, because they say, gee, this is taking a long time. For every minute extra I spend in the OR, I'm probably saving myself five minutes on the phone to explain to these patients why, why their pain is. Much less edema, fast healing, early return to work. I had one patient, because I remember this distinctly, she had the operation on Friday, and then she went back to work as a restaurant hostess on Thursday, because that was Thanksgiving Day. She wanted to work on Thanksgiving Day. I was thinking, oh, this may be questionable, a 24-year-old, but she went back to work. I had one guy that went back to work three days after his time selection. He was like a warehouse supervisor, so I don't know if he was just like downing the tunnel of codeine or what was happening. Now, I've had two bleeds, one on post-op day two. Post-op day two is very strange. It's usually 
immediate bleeding or like post op day six when the SCAR sort of comes off prematurely. And that's one thing I love about this because when patients are drinking, that SCAR stays thin, it, tastes, it stays slick, and I think there's going to be less post op bleeding. That's what some of the other studies show, but it's hard. I, I really have to do more formal numbers. Um, and I have one tonsil cyst infection where a girl, I took her tonsils out, and she had, like a year later, she had a sort of small abscess in a cyst that was there. And it's well known that you can get mucus retention cysts, but I hadn't really seen them. But, so I don't know. So anyway, this, I don't know if this counts as, no one's ever paid me anything from Microline. I got no money from them, but they do have a website, and people do call them up to say, who's doing this procedure? And they have the website in alphabetic order. There's Colorado. There's South Carolina. They say, well, where's Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> so there, so yeah, so I, so I am getting some some people coming from <laughs> from far away, and um, it's sort of gratifying. But I'd love to do more. I don't know if there's any other way, maybe to to get people um, knowledgeable about this technique. But I think that it's really going to be the coming trend. Just like copulation, it took them from 2004. 2011 to become the most popular way of taking out the tonsils. I, I think this is going to happen. But right now, I've got a monopoly in northern Illinois. I guess there's someone in Jackson, Illinois, and someone in Springfield, Illinois, that's not on the website. But so far, it's just the three of us. And the patients tell me this. I mean, they, they call Microline and say, say this. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, I was, I was hoping. Thanks very much.